Slater Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. You got me on a good day. I don't think I've ever been more hopeful. Now, maybe it's because uh, I had an awesome day yesterday. We made pancakes in the morning. We made chocolate chip cookies at night. Life is good. But uh, I think I actually have some actual evidence to prove my hopefulness for today. Of course, subject to change. I don't know how long this will last. We should do a morning show and an afternoon show, and they could be two totally, completely different shows, the way things are moving these days. Okay, two pieces of evidence here. First, the Imperial College models, and we don't, we're not gonna take time going again about how all these models, like no one's got a crystal ball, and I'm also, I'm not critical of anyone who was wrong initially or, or factors that weren't factored in properly or whatever, I'm not critical. We judge corrections, but the Imperial College team has made some major changes to their projections. Even in New York, they originally estimated a peak of 60,000 beds needed, and now they say they only need 25,000 beds, so less than half. Now, New York City, their ICUs are still potentially in bad shape, but the peak is in two days, Wednesday. And New York's by far the worst. California's peak was supposed to be the end of the month. I think it was the 27th of April. Now they've moved it up to the 14th of April, which is also great news economically about trying to get back into normal society, which we'll talk about a little later as well. But lowered the peak and moved it forward for California. And New York, or sorry, uh, California's way under our health system's capacity. Like not even close. Like, like number of beds is it's half of our, of our capacity. Florida's under capacity. Louisiana's completely under capacity. I know that was a big problem. Uh, Tennessee, Tennessee we brought up last week as the worst state that no one's talking about. Um, and they're way under capacity too. So you know the whole flatten the curve thing. We're on, the curve's flattened. Now, there's a couple things we can do with these projections. We can mock them for being so wrong in the first place, right? And this whole thing was never a big deal, but to begin with, we can, we can mock that and ridicule and complain and criticize. Or we can celebrate the fact that maybe what everyone did made a big difference in the spread of the virus. Or maybe we can still be concerned because there's probably going to be another spike to come as we all start to get back to real life until there's a vaccine, which will probably be years away. Or we can do something that people are uncomfortable with. All three of those can be true at the same time. We can question the experts for being so, wrong is a strong word, but you know, uh, with, with a modeling system in particular that we'll describe later is at best 13 years old with countless unknown variables in the formula itself. And that's their own words, unknowable. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we could sell, so we, so we can, we can criti not criticize, we can question and, and continue to take with a proper grain of salt uh, the experts moving forward. We can absolutely celebrate the fact that California is only expected to have 1,700 deaths total in a state of 40 million people. That's wonderful. And we should be concerned moving forward because we still have no idea what's coming next. Now, Here's my big concern. So I, get, I just want to break this paradigm of, of like right and wrong. Like everything can be true at the same time. All these different things can be true at the same time. All these things can be right or accurate, right? We need to kind of break the, the left, right, right, wrong paradigm in this, in this moment here. Here's my big concern moving forward. No one's going to admit they were wrong. And when this is over, the stay-at-home crowd is going to say they're all a bunch of heroes. And the this is overblown crowd are going to pat themselves on the back. And everyone's just... Right, and then we're going to go back to normal. <laughs> and we're just going to go snipe at each other nonstop. My concern is that for a while, in, in all of our uncertainty, there was this built-in humility that I think most people had. But now everybody's going to try and double down on their original position and dig in their heels to try to save face. And that's not good, because that's obviously going to keep us from getting to the truth, which is where we need to be. I'll give you an example. A good example. This is an example of what we all need to be doing more of, because we we've all been wrong uh, with one aspect of this. Uh, Dr. Drew. So I like Dr. Drew a lot. Super smart guy. Uh, not just a, you know, a TV celebrity doctor guy hack. Like he's like a real, genuine, smart person. And I like him a lot. From the jump, he's been saying that this whole thing's overblown. 
that this is just the flu, that we're way overreacting. So he was absolutely in the overreacting crowd, big time. And I would check on him every single day to help me walk me off the ledge. Right, so I'd read someone over on one side who's telling me that this thing's terrible and it's awful, and it, and, it's, and then I'd go, okay, what's Dr. Drew got to say? And Dr. Drew would say, hey, it's no big deal, don't worry, don't panic, the media, blah, 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 all this stuff. And then I'd, you know, figure out who was more convincing in the moment. So Dr. Drew's big time on that camp. He just posted this on Twitter on Saturday. My early comments about equating coronavirus with influenza were wrong. They were incorrect. I was part of a chorus that was saying that, and we were wrong. And I want to apologize for that. Uh, I wish I'd gotten it right, but I got it wrong. What I did not get wrong was every time I took a position, I always said, make sure you listen to Dr. Fauci, because he is the person we must look to. I was, you know, he was my uh, guiding star in the AIDS epidemic, and he should be your North Star now. I said that every time I took a position, I was, in, I was wrong about comparing influenza and coronavirus. That was loser think, as Scott Adam would say. They shouldn't be comparing the epidemics. I was comparing the numbers, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But uh, I want to be clear that I apologize for getting it wrong. I wish I'd gotten it right. So one of the principles of this show is perhaps the opposite is true. We have this really, really destructive concept in society about credibility, where if you admit you were wrong about something, people attack you, and it cuts down your credibility. But the opposite should be true. If someone has the courage enough to admit that they were wrong about something and course correct accordingly, that should increase their credibility. I have way more respect for Dr. Drew for admitting he was wrong. No matter where he ends up, right? Whether I agree with him or not, wherever he goes, it doesn't matter. Like he's, I was wrong, I observed this information, I changed my... And now I, I have way more respect for that person. And he increases his credibility. Because now I know moving forward, whatever he says, he, he took in all the, the, the appropriate wisdom, advice, data, et cetera, et cetera, to make his opinion. But so many people are going to attack Dr. Drew, say, oh, you were wrong, you're an idiot, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no time for that. Think about it in a military perspective. Like, we could all get that. Like, if there was a general who said, hey, you guys got to do this. Here's the plan. And then the men on the ground say, um... <laughs> Here's what we see down there. And the general's like, no, no, do it anyway. What kind of leader is that? You would, we would much highly, more highly regard the, the, the commander who says, okay, we've taken the new data. Let's now do this instead, right? We got to get, get rid of that knee-jerk reaction that, oh, he, he lost, he loses credibility. No, he gains credibility. Dr. Drew does. And so does everyone else who can admit they're wrong at some point. He went on to say that he, he originally did not consider the ferocity I believe that was the word he used, the ferocity of the disease and how hard it can, it can take even otherwise healthy people out. It's incredibly difficult to take a position early and then admit you were wrong. It's our human nature. I, I, and I'd argue, especially these days, in, right, in our cancel culture, where you can be canceled in an instant, where being curious and, and wanting to learn more is not seen as a virtue. Like you're expected to have all the answers all the time. And if you're wrong, then you're a terrible person because you're not on my side. We gotta get rid of that. Same is true of all the bureaucrats in DC and also every state who's making these decisions. If it turns out, I don't wanna say that this was overblown because we never know how much our behavior changed what could have been, right? So if you say overblown, that means that it was never a thing in the first place. I don't really want to use that word overblown. But if it turns out that this is not, it doesn't end up being the catastrophe that it could have been or whatever, this, this would be like the, the worst mistake in American history. And no politicians ever going to want to admit that they made such a huge, epic, massive mistake. No politician's going to want to get up there and be like, Wow, blew that one. We didn't need to do any of this. Uh, wow, well, we could have done a couple quarantines here with you know these people and you know blah blah. But it really, we would have been fine. We didn't need to shut down the entire. Like no one politician is going to say that. Matt Walsh said it great. He said it would be it would take an immense amount of moral courage for someone to stand in front of the nation and say this was the wrong approach. And who like who in the government do you trust to say that? I don't think any of them have that enough moral courage to do that. Which means, if this is overblown, it's going to keep being, people who think it's overblown are going to keep saying it's overblown for a long time. And the same is true for the other side, right? If this gets worse and worse, 
right? Or takes a turn, or maybe this fall comes back 10 times worse. The people who say it's overblown aren't going to have the moral courage to admit, like Dr. Drew said, I was wrong. Which means that this whole bad problem could go even longer because half the country, or whatever it is, doesn't think that doesn't think they need to do the things that they need to do to keep us all safe, right? So I, we got to make sure we don't stick in our teams. The virus isn't going to kill us all or end society. The virus is not going to end society. It's human nature. It's always human nature that does it. COVID, in this case, just brings these broken aspects of human nature to the forefront. And the human nature aspect, I should have started off with it. Sorry, it's pride. That's the story here. That's the root of all this. It's pride. Not wanting to admit you were wrong and not wanting to admit that you didn't have all the answers. I'll give one more example here. Of, uh, of our political bias, biases getting in the way. Hydroxychloroquine, or whatever, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Listen, I can pretend, I can do a pretty good job of pretending to be an epidemiologist. I'm not even gonna try to pretend to be a pharmacist or a scientist on this one. Uh, so I'm not gonna be like, oh, you should go take, you should go drink fish tank cleaner. <laughs> uh, HCQ is what it's being called. People who I value and, and admire and trust uh, are very optimistic, maybe too optimistic, about this treatment. But uh, I'm glad that, that there's, some, there's some direction on, on HTQ and some other different things maybe coming together to help people. And I'm more hopeful about that than I've ever been about anything in this entire thing so far. But again, we don't know. You know, Dr. Drew talked about listening to Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci is not totally on board with HCQ. He doesn't think yet that we have enough evidence to prove that this is something that could work. And that's fine. I mean, I don't know. And even if it did work, again, we'd still have to mass produce it and that would take a long time. We'd have to mass produce it for the whole world. So that could take many months. But here, my point is, you're going to have half the country, you know, people who hate Trump and nearly everyone in the media actively rooting against HCQ to help people because Trump talked about it weeks ago. Right? The left, we know. They've seen it a billion times. They have a knee-jerk reaction against anything that Trump does. The travel ban. Right? Trump bans travel from China months ago, and the media calls him a racist. And now they come back a couple weeks later, and they say Trump didn't do enough early enough. Kidding me? Right? Anything that Trump does, they're knee-jerk reaction against. And the left has a knee-jerk reaction against HCQ, and they're not going to report on it properly, and there's going to be probably some scientists and doctors who are going to be against it because it's the Trump cocktail. Right? Because Trump said it first, therefore it's dumb. And it's nothing I want to get involved with. That's dangerous. I read one pharmacist, he came out and he said, every time that I say HCQ lacks evidence, I'm a deep state plant. <laughs> and every time I point out that we do have some evidence in support uh, that could justify a trial, then I'm a, this big time Trump guy. He says, cut it out. You can't do proper science like that. He says, both sides, get out. Go do that somewhere else and let us do science. So... I'm more hopeful than ever. I think things this weekend took a turn for the better, and we should celebrate that right now, because who knows where things are going to go. But for the moment, can we celebrate where we're at, perhaps, while still keeping in mind that we have no idea what's to come, and we don't have a vaccine, and we have no consensus on how to get out of this mess. So for all those reasons, I am cautiously optimistic today. Coming up next, we're going to talk to the uh, retired colonel in the U.S. Army, who's an uh, infectious disease expert. We talked to him on our special on Friday. He's awesome. And then we have an ER doctor that we're going to talk to as well. So we've got the science aspect, we've got the medical aspect, and then we're going to talk about that uh, Navy captain uh, as well. Uh, I, I was wrong about the Navy captain. My wife was right. And that's always the right stance to take. Uh, it's all coming up. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Slater Crusaders, uh, one of our finest guests we've had recently is Dr. Michael Lewis. Colonel Michael Lewis uh, is an infectious disease expert, retired U.S. Army. He was in Southeast Asia during the, the SARS epidemic outbreak here. So, I mean, I mean, he's the guy to talk to. So, Dr. Colonel, how are you, sir? I'm doing great today. How are you guys Good. doing? Really glad you're here. I'm actually more hopeful today than I've been this entire time. Uh, can you um, give, it, give me something recently that you've learned that you think we need to know about this all? 
Well, uh, a couple of things. You know, of course, you're hearing about the different drug combinations that seem to be hopeful. Uh, I, I've been reading a little bit about the potential of some vaccine development that seems to be promising. But, I, you know, actually, one of the things that makes me the most hopeful is what's going on in Seattle. Nobody's really talking about it. And that's actually a really good thing because there's not much going on in Seattle. Um, and so why is that? You know, we had that whole, that was sort of the center of everybody's focus a couple of weeks ago. And now it's just kind of disappeared because they've done a really, really good job public health wise of controlling the disease, applying um, testing, contact tracing, doing what we call field epidemiology. And it's been incredibly successful as far as I can tell. Okay, so I don't want to get into a whole thing here, but I, I do think this is important. Do you think, because we saw the Imperial College models came out again yesterday, and it's everything's way downgraded from what they were even a couple days ago. Uh, you know, peaks are way smaller. Uh, peaks are way closer in time. So do you think that's because everything we've done is working, or do you think it's because it was never as virulent as a, of a disease in the first place? I, there is absolutely no way to prove one way or the other. And unfortunately, um, mm. you know, the, I think I said back at the beginning, not, not uh, in this interview, but, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it's a lose-lose situation. When you're talking about prevention, yeah. if it works, nothing happens, and then everybody says you overreacted. The only way we know it, anything about it is when it doesn't work, and then everybody gets the blame. So... Um, there's absolutely yeah. no way to tell. And I, I think we need to be really careful about, uh, you, you know, depends on which side of the coin you want to look at. I would go with the optimist side, say that what we've done yeah. has and is working. And I think we're actually starting to see that in Japan now. I was just reading this morning that, you know, they were pretty good, but now they may be starting to see a second wave because they didn't really apply strict measures. And so now all of a sudden it looks like they're uh, they're having to play catch up. So I, I yeah, would it's say- be interesting. So I, 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 and I love that answer. I love that answer. We'll, we'll have to look at Japan, we'll have to look at Sweden, right? So there's a couple of case studies out there. And obviously the third world countries who couldn't, who can't even do these social distancing measures, right? We'll see how things blow through India and places in Africa, Correct. right? That'll give us some data. Yeah. It hasn't really, okay. uh, it hadn't really caught on in Africa, and you know they're not going to have the resources to be able to deal with it like we do in uh, in the U.S. or some of the other countries. Yeah, so that might be able to tell us, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but that may be able to tell us whether or not it would have been a big deal here too if we didn't do anything, depending on how things go there. I, I think that will help us make some conclusions, but again, there's no real way to tell. Uh, that's the thing about prevention. When it works, nothing happens, and that's exactly yeah. why we do it and what we hope for. Let's talk about HCQ. What do you know about this drug? Why do you think it could potentially maybe be a nice treatment? What about it? Well, my understanding is that it, uh, well, you know, first of all, um, hydro hydroxychloroquine, um, I had to think about that for a second. Um, you know, it's a malaria drug. And so it's one of the chloroquine derivatives. There's a couple of them. There's uh, chloroquine, of course, is the original one, Hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine, if I, anyway. Uh, H we're, we're all gonna get good at saying that eventually. <laughs> yeah, just like epidemiologists, uh, I used to stumble over epidemiologists all day. I stick with chloroquine, it's easier. Um, yeah. But then there's other ones like mefloquine and tafenoquine. And so, you know, I don't know if anybody's really talking about these, but, you know, things like mefloquine and some of the other chloroquine derivatives uh, that have been used for malaria have been a serious mental health problem, uh, particularly with the military. Um, oh, you know, geez. as far as you'll, if you look up mefloquine, which is a derivative of chloroquine, there's some serious issues uh, as far as side effects of it. And I think, you know, when we say everybody should be using it and it's not going to be a problem, I think that that's a, a little naive and, um, and, and I'm a little bit worried that we may jump to the conclusion too quickly. Okay, all right. So everything's about trade-offs, right? So that's that's been the theme of, of the year for me, just in life. Everything's about trade-offs, and that medicines obviously do. So what are some side effects if, if taken, well, what are some side effects of these drugs? 
Well, the, the biggest one that's often described is vivid dreams. I mean, honestly, what it does is it messes with your brain. And so uh, at least with mefloquine, which is sort of a longer acting, a little more potent one, um, it's been linked to suicides, mental health, uh, Gulf War syndrome, uh, a number of mental uh, health related things. So I'm a little bit worried about that. Now the hydroxychloroquine is supposedly, you know, less uh, has less side effects, and the other one is there's um, a deficiency in an enzyme in people, particularly in uh, African uh, descent and Mediterranean descent, uh, called G6PD deficiency. And actually, because my my mother's background is Mediterranean, I actually have G6PD de deficiency, like got none. And I basically was told by leading malaria researchers in the military, don't ever even be in the same room as these drugs because basically it'll kill me. So what? Yeah, that's about five to ten percent of our population. And so, wow, it, these things are not without um, without its Man. potential. Okay. All right. So I'm. Um, I'm my personality is like, I'm quick. I'm like, let's do this all in, right? So I, I read one little quick article about it, and I'm like, give it to everybody. Why? And I think people like Dr. Fauci are much more like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> let's read it. <laughs> what are the things that we, like, how does a trial work? And everything's very anecdotal right now, different hospitals trying different things. How long does it take, and what's the whole process towards coming towards any sort of consensus on the right way to do treatment for this? Well, I, you know, I fall somewhere in between. I'm a little bit like you, you know, I think there's some things that we could and should be trying. And I'm a little bit, you know, especially when we're in times like this, where we're really searching for something. Um, and so, you know, you would go to the hot spots. You'd go to New York City, for example. And, you know, there's a couple of different things. One is, is, does it work in people who are really severe on the edge of death? Um, does it work for so you would want to look at that. You would want to look at, does it work for mild um, disease? What about people that uh, are test positive but not really having any symptoms? And then there's a whole other one of, what about their contacts? And you know, people that may be exposed, would it keep them from getting the disease in the first place? So there's lots of different ways. The, uh, the quickest is, of course, um, you know, the people who have symptoms, and going downhill, can we reverse that course quickly? And that's something we could learn literally in a few days. Uh, the, some okay. of the more prevention style ones would take a couple of weeks probably. Is it hard to know if someone has a G6PD deficiency? No, not at all. It's a routine okay. blood test that uh, most hospitals okay. should be able to do. So the, I read an article about a doctor in Brazil who's very hot on this HCQ and other things. And he says it should be given, in his experience, he's given it to people who had uh, symptoms from day two to four. So pretty early in the process. And he says that can prevent them from having ICU treatment later on. So that seems like, that seems riskier to me, right? If there are side effects, if you're gonna give it to someone that early in the process, no? No, I don't. I don't think that. Um, okay. I don't think the side effects are going to be any different if it's early or later. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the hydroxychloroquine, from what I understand, though, doesn't have the level of side effects. And there may be. And I was even reading they believe it may be safe for people with G6PD deficiency. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look into that a little bit further. But you know, there's some other ones that are really actually quite interesting. I'm surprised you didn't bring it up. Um, you know, they're looking at Viagra right now uh, as a what? potential therapy. So, how, how could that? What, what could possibly be there? <laughs> well, Viagra works on what we call the nitric oxide system, and nitric oxide it's in the basically in the walls of the blood vessels of, of our arteries, and it when it's released, it helps relax the blood flow. That's why it works where it works. Um, you know, <laughs> the little blue pill or pink pill, whatever color it is, um, is more blood flow. Um, so more blood flow leads to better oxygenation. And in fact, I actually think, and there's some, there's some preliminary evidence out of Wuhan and some other people in some of the groups that I'm talking with, 
that are looking at hyperbaric oxygen therapy or how you know hyperbaric oxygen chambers so one of my questions is what if you combine basically viagra or even inhaled nitric oxide and hyperbaric uh conditions like hyperbaric chamber would we get a greater effect and you know everything points to um, you know, scientifically, physiologically, it actually makes more sense. So I, I hope we start to look at some of these things. All right. So, doctor, help me. Tell me how to feel. So right, right now, I'm a little overwhelmed because I see a lot of different potential things. But as you said, everything's a trade-off. And how long does all this take? Right. So, so how long do you think? We'll start there. How long do you think this would take before we're like, hey, this is the thing we should do? I, you know. We're living in really interesting times. Uh, we're moving, you know, every day there's new news. Um, I, I, I'm i going to be hopeful. I'm going to say that, you know, this hydroxychloroquine is probably by the end of the week is going to be pretty standard of care. Uh, I wow. would hope that we start to look at, now that's just my guess. I have absolutely sure, no sure, inside sure. knowledge on that. Um, no. I hope we get a little bit better look at nitric oxide and potentially even Viagra and, like I said, even hyperbaric oxygen. Okay, then so you're encouraged. I'm I'm very encouraged. You know, yeah, that's great. What I'm not encouraged about is the concept of a vaccine. Uh, you know, yeah. viruses happen. Viruses are part of nature. You cannot control as much as we think we can and want to. You can't control Mother Nature, and so I think. Um, I think virus, you know, uh, vaccines are gonna. It, it's almost like publicity. It makes people feel like we're doing something, but I'm not real hopeful on on the vaccine side of okay. things. I think so we're gonna if, better control it. If we had a treatment, would you really need a vaccine in order for us to go out and live our lives relatively normal? Well, that's a great question, and um, no, I don't think you do at all. I think. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm aware of certain vaccine efforts over the last 20, 30 years, even 40 years, um, that seem like, you know, folly, really a waste of money when we had good treatments. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, it's just an easy antibiotic would get rid of the, the issue at hand. And so, yeah. I, I honestly, I don't think we need a vaccine, but I think that it doesn't hurt to be looking for it. I think it helps sure. our just helps our knowledge. But you think a tre if we had a good treatment, then we could kind of still go as we were in life relatively. You know, we're not exactly sure what that could look like, but we wouldn't have to live in fear if we had a good treatment, you think? I, I think so. And, you know, look at influenza. We've got a couple of really good treatments now for influenza. Look at HIV, another virus. You know, HIV yeah. was a death sentence. It's now a chronic disease. So I think, you know, there's not an HIV vaccine. There's not, you know, so I think that that should give us hope. And I think that okay. we're going to see this be part of our typical fall, winter mm -hmm. flu season, really. Wow. Okay. Colonel Dr. Michael Lewis, U.S. Army infectious disease expert. Uh, Colonel, thank you as always, sir. Thank you for your insight. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, maybe we, really you know, good. can continue to do this as we move along and, and have better news each time. Yeah. Ah, beautiful. Love that. Thank you, Colonel. Appreciate you. Coming up next, All we're right. going to talk to uh, ER doctor. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word. Slater Crusaders, let's keep this party going. This is an unbelievable show, unbelievable guest today. I'm so incredibly grateful. Dr. Mark Bruce is here. Uh, he's a, an acting uh, clinician at a do, uh, his hospital in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, he is the ambassador to Belize in Canada for the American College of Emergency Physicians. He's got a book called Jackie, A Boy and a Dog, a warm Cold War story as well. And he was in Asia during the SARS epidemic and, and has been working 24-hour shifts recently. Uh, Doctor, first, thank you for your service. Thanks for working on the front lines. Well, it's a privilege. It really is. And this is kind of what we signed up for. Yeah, uh, well, we're grateful. Um, tell us what you've seen the last few days, Doctor. 
you know, we are actually seeing a lower census than what we normally expect to see, but we're seeing a lot more admissions. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of worried well, <clears throat> and a number of people that come in with, uh, you know, things that they should be in, in an emergency department for. But uh, we are certainly doing a fair amount of COVID-19 testing. We're screening those patients uh, that do come in. Uh, I actually had the first positive patient uh, with COVID-19 at my institution. That was about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so it, it's here so, and we're seeing it. Do you, and I don't, I don't want to get all into modeling and whatever, but what are, what are your expectations for your hospital and for Wisconsin in the days to come? Are you guys still waiting for a tidal wave? Do you think the tidal wave is going to hit? It's going to stay pretty level? What are your expectations? Well, we, we look to Chicago because we're fairly close to Chicago to uh, get some feel for what we can experience. And my son is actually a plastic surgery resident down in Chicago, and is, he's in his fourth of, of six years there. And they met with the epi epidemiologist about five days ago, and his question to them was, when can we expect the peak? And their response was, today. Well, that was five days ago, and they're still waiting for the peak, which tells us mm. that the social distancing is working. It's flattening that curve. But we feel that we're probably a week to 10 days behind Chicago. And we are a little bit more concerned, I think, than even some of the larger medical centers uh, in Wisconsin, because uh, rural facilities, critical access facilities, just don't have the same resources available to us. For example, I don't have an ICU in my hospital. So anybody wow. who's really, really sick, we're gonna have to stabilize and transfer out if there's space available. And if there's not space available, we'll make uh, we'll, we'll certainly treat that patient within the resources that we do have. Yeah, that's so interesting because we you know we uh, first we looked at America as a single unit, and then I think people started looking at the states as a single unit. But that's not even enough, right? You need to look at each individual town and each little individual hospital's capacity. It is, and you know there's a, a fair amount of stress right now just with kind of surge planning. Uh, you know, the hospital that we have depends uh, a lot on revenue from their clinic system and from their, their outpatient specialty clinic system. Yeah. And that is all shut down right now. So it, it is a tremendous challenge that, uh, you know, we need to look. Uh, the last thing you wanted to have is a lot of hospitals start closing because they don't have any cash on hand. Whoa, no, no, I have not thought of that one time. I've heard anyone talk about that. I'm so grateful you brought that up. What have you seen or, or heard about the severity of this disease that we need to be aware of? That's a great question. And I'll tell you, one of the things that is really bothersome to me is that the general public sometimes is just not getting it. I had a patient that came in with chest pain that we needed to admit uh, for some further testing. This was on... Uh, on on Saturday, and the patient's spouse was extremely agitated and angry because we have a no visitor policy now, just because we're trying, the first rule of any epidemic or pandemic is you protect the uninfected. And so we have other patients in the department, we have our staff in the department, and we basically have really clamped down, and this is a, a very common policy that we have. So she was, going through all kinds of uh, uh, verbal uh, discourse with our staff to the point where we almost had to call the police because she was claiming that this whole thing was a hoax and that uh, people in town were not infrequently having garage parties, basically uh, not following the social distancing, which, you know, they're, they're going to pay a, a significant price for that, I fear. But the severity of illness is very real. The problem is, is we don't know why, especially the younger people, when they get it, sometimes are becoming very, very ill and are dying from this. Granted, we know that there is a very vulnerable population, and those are the older people, people older than 60 people that have chronic disease at any age that are, are at substantial risk for having bad outcomes with this. Are there any other comorbidities that, obviously, you know, respiratory, I mean, that one makes obvious sense. 
Is there any other comorbidities that you've been looking at that could cause concern? Yeah, there are. And those are people that are immune compromised, people that may have, like I say, chronic disease processes like AIDS, uh, diabetes is a big one, uh, hypertension, people that have known heart disease, people that have stents or have gone through heart surgery before. But, you know, there's a subset of people that have absolutely no risk that for probably uh, issues that are related to their own physiology allow them to kind of manufacture this virus at a much higher degree and put them at, at again, substantial risk. We saw this in, in the Italy statistics where there was this this 1% of people that were dying of this disease that had absolutely no risk and were young. And that's a, a significant concern because not only are they uh, maybe uh, much more casual about their approach to this and therefore put them at risk for spreading this around. So that's, that's the whole idea behind the social distancing that Dr. Fauci and the president have been been really uh, uh, emphasizing. And, and like I say, this, the statistics that we see out of Chicago certainly validate that this does work and it is flattening so what, the curve. I agree with you, but what would you say with the people who say, this is overblown, none of this was really necessary, it's way too much, it's not worth the cost? Well, if you're going to err, you want to err on the side of caution. And I keep going back to the first rule of any epidemic is to protect the uninfected. And that's how you keep an epidemic from becoming a pandemic. And that's how you keep a pan or get a pandemic under control. So, I, and we saw this over in Asia during the SARS epidemic, uh, where uh, that never became a pandemic because that rule was followed. And so part of the reason why we're having, I think, such a hard time with getting the general public to accept these draconian measures is because our memory of SARS is very dim, whereas the memory of SARS over in Asia was, was vivid. And so for two reasons. Number one, all of Asia recognized the bad information that they got out of China at that time. And they learned not to trust that kind of information, especially in a culture that puts significant political constraints on science and medicine. So whenever Taiwan, South Korea, Bangkok, Singapore first got wind that there was significant person-to-person -person spread of this disease, they immediately clamped down. And that's why they have not had the issues associated uh, that Italy has had and Europe has had and now we're experiencing because of that memory. On that, sort of the flip of that, one of my concerns is because the original models and expectations were millions dead in America, and maybe we don't see that because as you said, we've been doing all the right things. If this thing spikes up again in the fall, I think people will be like, ah, it was no big deal. We didn't need to do that. And then it's gonna be way worse in the fall. What do you think about that concern? Well, first of all, if we can push this off, the whole part of the idea behind flattening the curve is that allows us to have a lot more time to get the resources we need to really, first of all, protect people ourselves, but also have effective treatments. And we're starting to see some evidence of that uh, creep out. You know, you, you make good decisions when you have good data. And that's so true that the whole idea behind medical science is that you do studies, you find out, okay, what medication is going to work at what dosage, who gets it for how long? Mm. Because a lot of these medications have potential side effects that could be worse than the disease itself. So that's where we are right now is in this data gathering uh, process. Mm. And when we get that good data, we're gonna be able to make a lot better decisions. In the meantime- Are, are you, in sorry to interrupt, is that, are you encouraged by what you've been hearing so far about things like HCQ and maybe some other things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, okay. I think that there's great, great, great promise with that. And uh, especially that in combination with azithromycin has shown a, a, the, the plaquenil or hydro, hydrochloro, uh, hydroxychloroquine is a medication that has shown to have some protective effect. Uh, and also once people do get infected, certainly can mitigate a lot of their symptoms. But especially in combination with azithromycin, those are medications that certainly look like they have a may have a significant role in treating acute disease. 
what, so listen, I'm, I've pretended to be an epidemiologist these last few weeks. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be a pharmacist, but we've heard a little bit about HCQ as it's a malaria drug and whatever. What's zithromycin? What is that in the past? Zithromycin is uh, it's an antibiotic commonly prescribed for respiratory illnesses. It is a, a okay. class of antibiotic that we call a macrolid. Uh, and we use that a lot, especially with patients that have infections that are associated with chronic disease like emphysema or chronic bronchitis, things like that. Doctor, I have a ton more questions. I was going to do a completely different last segment, but you're too valuable of a resource. Are you able to stick around for a few more minutes and we can wrap up the show? Sure. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Mark Bruce, doctor in Wisconsin, uh, been part of SARS and, and all that stuff, and um, he's working right now, working hard, 24-hour shifts. Dr. Mark Bruce, we'll talk more with the doctor next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Sears, I, I wanted to do the last segment about the, the Navy captain. Uh, I'll just give you the punchline of the story because I want to go back into Teddy Roosevelt's history because he did a very similar thing, uh, and that's the namesake of the aircraft carrier that this captain is on. Um, and uh, I want to read that story. We'll do that tomorrow. Uh, but the punchline of the day is that over the weekend, the Navy captain got diagnosed with COVID himself. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But right now, we have an ER doctor, and I... I I'm so grateful for his time. I just want to keep asking more of these questions to the doctor as we get more and more of this information. Uh, doctor, thanks for sticking around. So we talked with the Army colonel, an infectious disease expert in the last segment, and he talked about potential side effects with not HCQ, but maybe some of its other derivatives or whatever. Um, what do you think about any potential side effects with this process? And what do we, not doctors, need to understand about this whole process of figuring out how treatments work and don't work? Well, again, that's the whole crux of medical science is that, uh, as I mentioned before, you make good decisions when you have good data. And so this is a, a well, this is an old medication. We know that certain types of malaria, malarial strains have become resistant to chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine also. So there's other types of anti-malarial drugs that I'm sure that they're going to be looking at and trialing. Uh, but ag again, this is a medication that has been around for a long time. It's tried and true for its intended purpose. But now, as any type of medication, it looks like it's got some potential use in this new disease. That's amazing. And how do you, if you, if you had a patient, what would you tell them as you're trying something like this? That's something that may have side effects as well. Well, we, we always try and let patients have, you know, all the information that they need to kind of help us make good decisions too. The, the information that came out about uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in general is that its primary use right now is, as I mentioned, for an anti-malarial drug, but also in treatment of lupus, which is an autoimmune process. And so patients that were already on this medication showed significant resistance to getting this disease to getting COVID-19. And that's where the interest really started coming. We got that initial kind of hint of information from China, but that has since been validated. We have, like I said, we have learned to be very, very skeptical about information that we're getting from China. So now whenever we get something from China, we like to kind of back that up with other experience. So that's where we are right now is getting that good data again in terms of who gets this medication uh where is it safe to get uh, who's safe to get this medication at what dosage for how long uh very good what do you know about and i've only read i've skimmed one article about this but plasma and and getting people who've already had covid and recovered getting their blood from it what is that process what's going on there yeah i i think that that's a that's a, uh, an intervention that's probably going to be really useful in treating patients that have really critical disease, those patients that are in ICU. Uh, that's not something that you can give to everybody. Uh, right. But for, for people that uh, are, are, you know, are on a ventilator or are critically ill in an ICU, that's, those are, those are uh, interventions that have been proven uh, effective in other diseases uh, that, you know, where people produce antibodies, you can do antibody transfusions to try and 
give that patient a jump start in in uh, that fighting the disease. Nice. So you see potential promise there. Is there any like scaling issues with that, et cetera, or, or can we kind of hit the ground running there? Uh, yeah, that's a big problem with scaling because that's that's something that has to be harvested. You have to have donors for that. So that's mm. you're, you're going to have a fairly limited uh, utility for that. But uh, again, in severe cases, it looks like it's going to be something that has some promise. Good, good. What do we know about kids and why it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like kids aren't getting this or getting very sick from it. What do we know about that so far? It, it probably has to do with the fact that their immune response is not as robust as somebody else. In other words, as you're growing, your immune response is learning how to kind of react to any kind of disease or challenge. And so as you get older, you're going to kind of react a lot uh, differently than what you do when you're younger. And a lot of that reaction has to do with an inflammatory response, producing inflammatory type of chemicals within your bloodstream that can be harmful. So kids Wait, are- so this is so wild. So this is, this is backwards from what I thought, right? Because the important key here is it's not the virus that kills you, kills people for the most part. It's the, it's the immune system's response causes inflammation that can kill you. Exactly. Wow, so because kids don't have as strong of an immune response, they therefore don't have the inflammation, which then causes respiratory problems, et cetera. Yeah, it's almost counterintuitive. Whoa. Isn't it? Yes. Wow. Well, huh, I would have thought that kids have a stronger immune system response, but that's wrong. Well, they just have a different immune response. And again, when, as, as you are kind of growing and developing, you will, over time, develop a, more of an immune response in terms of what you're exposed to. The challenge that we have, though, is those patients that are on chemotherapy, that are on AIDS drugs, things along those lines, you know, sometimes can have no immune response or a very, very impaired yeah, yeah. immune response which allows the virus to totally, you know, go unchecked and replicate and then create all kinds of havoc in the process. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting drugs that's also been studied in this is remdesivir, which is actually an AIDS drug. And so uh, there's so much that we're learning about this virus every day that is, is, it's a novel virus. You know, we didn't know this before four months ago. And so we are on a learning curve in terms of how this responds, how it reacts. We know that viruses morph. And so yeah, there's yeah. already seen some a little bit of morphing of this COVID-19 virus, but it has not morphed into a more virulent strain. SARS oh, and MERS were both more virulent than what this is, much higher death rate than COVID-19 probably five yes. to seven times more lethal than COVID-19. Um, last question, we only have about a minute. And I would not normally ask this because obviously I don't I want to put you on the spot and no one knows. I think that's the big lesson of this whole thing is like no one knows anything for sure. But I think for our own sanity and mental health, can you give us maybe your best estimate of some sort of time frame for something? <laughs> or whatever that even means, like time frame for when treatments you think become known and readily available or time frame for when you think we can kind of go back to living a somewhat normal life or just any sort of time frame we can wrap our head around? Yeah, I think it's probably going to be just in terms of weeks rather than months. I, 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 and matter of fact, I think in the next week or two, we're going to get some significant guidance from some of the data that is being collected right now in terms of wow. this wow. looks like a good treatment. So I, I, I have a great hope, uh, like I say, over the next week or two, I think we're gonna see that kind of information come out. Super encouraging. Dr. Mark Bruce, wonderful. Sir, let's talk uh, next week and, and hopefully we can talk more of this data and get some more things pinned down. Sounds good. Good to be with Thank you, Mike. Thank you, sir. Do Thank you for your time. Uh, Dr. Mark Bruce, uh, ER doctor at a, at a, a, a Cutner Rural Hospital in uh, Wisconsin. All right, beautiful. So listen, started off the show optimistic, was totally prepared to have the colonel and the ER doctor come in and just crush me and be like, no Slater, things are hopeless. Uh, but it seems like both of those guys are pretty optimistic as well moving forward. Weeks, not months. That is good stuff. Beautiful. Okay, stay tuned here on the first. Mike Slater, true story. See you tomorrow, spread the word.